Welcome to Elector Engineering Insights, the show that puts your engineering challenges to the industry's experts. I'm your host, Stuart Cording, the electronics reporter. Embedded C has been the mainstay of microcontroller programming throughout my career. In fact, it's hard to imagine the industry without it. I think we all gain some comfort from seeing main and then diving into the functionality from there. Of course, embedded C is just C. It's just that embedded software programs have a different mental mi mind map uh, as they use it. One that is intimately related to the hardware of the microcontroller chosen. Despite decades of use, there are still plenty of common mistakes that experts uncover when helping people with their embedded C projects. So what are they? How can we learn from the experts? And how can we do that more quickly? To find out more about the do's and don'ts around Embedded C, my expert for this episode is Chris Rose, Director of the Electrical and Electronic Design Consultancy, Electric Innovation. Let's bring in Chris. Hi there, Chris. There we go, now I've got you. <laughs> so uh, could you just briefly introduce Electric Innovation, your, uh, your company, and explain a little bit about what role Embedded C plays in its day-to-day -day operation and, and what you do? Um, yeah, so Electric Innovation is my company. Uh, it's actually on a bit of hiatus at the moment, so that makes that bit easy. Um, I have other work that I'm concentrating on. Um, but uh, yeah, so in terms of Embedded C, that almost by accident has ended up being what I'm known for. Um, so initially I ran some courses on that a few years back um, they also um, went on hiatus because of covid and lockdowns and things like that so I, I didn't quite get as much out of that as i'd hoped but i did manage to run a few and they seem to be fairly well received um, and around about the same time i got approached and asked if i wanted to write a book which is essentially how we've ended up here today i suppose exactly yeah super Super, then um, hang in there for a second, because I've just got to do one small task before we get into those questions and start talking about some of those details on Embedded C and the contents of your book in a little bit more detail. Thanks. Now, this episode is sponsored by TME. Products for makers and hobbyists are a solid and growing segment of the TME product portfolio. The most popular are Arduino boards, ranging from the iconic Uno Rev 3 through to the MKR and Nano series, up to the Portenta boards focused on the needs of professional developers. Arduino's, Arduino's latest addition to the lineup, the Uno Rev 4 Minima and Uno Rev 4 Wi Fi, can also be ordered directly from the website at tme.eu. Now, I've been fascinated by programming embedded systems in C since I first came into contact with microcontrollers. I quickly saw the difference between what I'd learned at university on my PC and how it was used in the context of embedded hardware. So that means I have plenty of questions for my guest. This show is recorded, so we won't be having our usual live audience questions. However, if you do have some, join in the conversation by posting your thoughts and comments on YouTube, reaching out to me on LinkedIn, or post a tweet using the hashtag ElectorEI, and I'll do my best to get answers or guide you to resources that might help. So let's get back to Chris. So thanks ever so much for joining us for today. I was, I was fascinated to, uh, discover you. I was just going through LinkedIn and uh, your profile came about up and I, I saw that you'd launched the book and I thought it was a really exciting and industry uh, interesting topic because, um, you know, there, there are so many pitfalls in using C um, on embedded systems. Now, C is still the de facto programming language for embedded uh, systems. However, we've seen a lot of back and forth on LinkedIn of late. I think you, you were involved in some of those conversations as well where people to see, seem to think that embedded C is somehow different from C as a language. Could you start by providing the explanation of, of how you see the difference between C as Kernighan and Ritchie defined it in their famous book and what embedded C programmers use on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so in terms of Kernighan and Ritchie, uh, we're going back uh, probably about 40 years to the first edition now when another 30 years for the second and Dennis Ritchie said there wouldn't be a third because the language had changed so much um, since he had created it. Um, 
So it's a, a fairly old language um, in terms of languages still being used. I can only think of two or three similar sorts of age that are still around. Um, so as a result, there's a whole load of dialects of C. Um, arguably, there's not really a single C language. There's a whole load of languages that have a common base. Um, that being said, there's not an official embedded C language. Um, there is a standard, which is a set of extensions that sometimes gets referred to as embedded C. Um, but where I would say there is a difference is in um, there's certain subtleties in the language. So in the introduction, you mentioned Maine. Um, one of the interesting things there, I suppose, is that Maine is only uh, part of C for what are called hosted implementations uh, in the standard. So for standalone implementations, which is quite often what we're doing in embedded, um, you don't have to have a main function. Uh, the fact is many of them still do, uh, but it's entirely up to the compiler creator whether or not they do that. Um, so there's, there's one difference immediately there. What we're dealing with is what the, um, what the standard refers to as freestanding implementations uh, a lot of the time rather than hosted implementations. Um, we also have to deal with things like interrupts or directly interacting with hardware. Those aren't things that are properly defined in the standard anywhere. So there's no C standard way to manage interrupts. So what we end up doing is using compiler extensions or some other method uh, to do that. So there are definitely differences there. Um, again, there's no official embedded C standard, uh, but then arguably the C standard itself is um, not really a standard. There are so many dialects and variations. Um, it just doesn't, doesn't quite make sense to say there's one C standard. Everybody has their own extensions. Everybody has their own okay. uh, variations on that. And even if we look at the official standardized versions, which parts of which standard are supported varies massively from compiler to compiler as it is. I think I think that's one of the things that might surprise people as they read your book is how much of C is sort of weakly, I would say, defined. I don't know if that's the right term. I mean, one, one of the examples is something like a, a char isn't, um, you know, you think of a char and you think, oh, eight bits, but it's not. It's a minimum of eight bits, I think, which which means on some platforms it could be larger. I mean, I've I've had um, DSPs where, you know, what you'd expect to be a 32 bit um, variable is actually only 24 because there's only 24 bits available. I mean, what are the sort of common gotchas that people get caught out by due to these sort of assumptions and, and maybe others? Yeah, so, I mean, in terms of char being eight bits, that's a common assumption. In fact, it's something I was told at university when I first learned C is a char is always eight bits. Um, but I can think of at least one series of TI microcontrollers where it's 16 bits and those same micro microcontrollers have I believe a 40 bit long double um, and I can't think of any other platform that uses 40 bits for a, a long double uh, but yeah there's a great many gotchas there if you like um, so the standard has uh, literally hundreds of undefined and unspecified behaviors and then we have implementation defined behaviors um, so undefined behaviors, you don't want to go anywhere near. Basically, that is something uh, where we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, what has happened a lot in the past is it's done the most intuitive thing it could. Um, so some people almost see them as a feature, uh, but they're really not. And what we find now is that compilers are very good at optimizing. And if they see something that could be undefined behavior, they have a tendency to optimize it out, um, which can completely change the behavior of your program. But in terms of other areas, um, even things that are well-defined, um, you can find there's gotchas there. Uh, integer promotion is a good example. So it's fairly easy to write a, a piece of uh, software in C where you end up having a statement, say an if statement that um, you, know, you have if you have a signed number, you compare it to an unsigned number, 
Um, so you can have a positive number, you compare it to minus one, but because of the integer promotion rules, um, if you say, I want, you know, if this signed number, unsigned number is greater than minus one, uh, do whatever. But because of the integer promotion rules, what you find is the unsigned number, uh, or the signed number, sorry, becomes unsigned. And then the yeah. comparison takes place. And so you've got a positive number that's supposedly less than minus one and your test fails. Um, so there's all sorts of strange things like that. And that's well-defined in the language. That's how it's supposed to behave, if you like. Yeah. No, exactly. I think um, there's definitely definitely one of those things that, that catches people out. And um, I think that's sort of one of the reasons why you've written this book is to sort of highlight all those things and make sure people properly understand um, the tool that they have in their hand. Now, one of the things you cover is the history of the C language, where it came, how it came about, and uh, a bit about the sort of standardization of C. And you mentioned that today you'd expect most compilers to fulfill what's called the C99 standard. Um, could you just sort of briefly give us a, an overview of like, where are we with standardization of C as a language today? Where do we find the official standards and, and can mere mortals like our, like me, for example, actually understand them? Because I, re I remember reading Koenig and Ritchie and the, the first two thirds of the book are, are fairly OK to understand. And the, set, the, the back third is, is almost impossible. Um, so, you know, is, is, you know, how, how do we translate what they've written and described so that we can actually use it? Yeah. Um... So the, the standards are available from ISO. At the moment, the current version is C17 or C18, depending on who you ask. Um, but really, um, C11, which is the previous version, and C18, the current version, are not well supported. Uh, I don't really know of any compiler that fully supports them that I can think of, uh, which is why I say you know, stick to C99. Um, in terms of readability, I I would say they're not the most accessible documents you can find. Um, partly because um, they're trying to be very precise. Um, so they read a bit like a, a legal document, say, where you think it says one thing, but there's some subtlety has crept in and it says something very slightly different. Um, and I think that doesn't help the confusion. Uh, you can, if you go on something like Stack Overflow and someone's asking C questions, there'll be someone who's pulled up the relevant part of the, the C standard. And it doesn't seem to answer the question because it's su in such strange language. It's not the way that you and I would speak to each other um, if we were discussing C. Um, sort of even in a very professional environment, you wouldn't um, start saying, oh, undefined behavior is a construct of this type. It, you would just say undefined behavior is bad and don't do it. But uh, yeah, they have to be very precise. So um, they're not the most accessible. I think it was Peter van der Linden uh, described people who can read the standard as something like standards lawyers. Um, so it's, uh, yeah. It, it's almost a profession in itself to be able to understand what they're trying to say. Think, I don't think I'll ever reach that level. <laughs> um, I don't think I'll be spending too much time doing it having written the book. Um, it's not something I want to do in depth again. <laughs> well, it's good that you've got that behind you. Uh, so while we're on this topic of compilers, we sort of we've thrown the term compilers out there. I think it's it's worth mentioning that typically what we actually mean is a tool chain that includes as part of it a C compiler. Um, what are all the steps of compiling code? And are there standards for each of those co um, for each of those steps as well beyond the C compiler itself? Yeah, so you're quite right. The C compiler. Um, is only a small part of that. Uh, the standard defines sort of nine or 10 steps. Uh, the first few of those are what we tend to think of as pre-processing. Uh, and there's more to that than the normal programmer's interaction with the pre-processor. It does all sorts of things that you don't think about. So um, it strips out lots of white space, for instance. So any empty lines, uh, any 
unneeded spaces, it will strip those out. It also does something called tokenization, which is converting your variable names into an internal representation that uh, the compiler can then uh, pass around and change to uh, an address in memory or a register or whatever it decides to do with it. Um, and then there is sort of a, another chunk of those steps are really what we think of as compiling, which is taking the source code and turning that ultimately into machine code. Um, whether it does that via an intermediate step, uh, which normally means converting it to assembler or some other low level representation first and then converting that to source uh, machine code or not is entirely up to the compiler. I think it's only one step in the standard is actually devoted to that translation part. And then the final stage is linking. Um, now, if you have a single file as your source code, uh, linking is fairly simple because uh, it's it's just taking that and putting it into various locations in memory. But of course, most projects now are not a single file. Um, they're potentially tens or even hundreds of files. Each of those needs to be compiled separately. And then the linker is responsible for tying them all together. Um, yeah, so that's sort of a very high level overview of of what goes on. Um, obviously, yeah. there's a lot of fine detail in there. Now, I know sort of if, if you follow the rules um, or sort of, let's say, the instructions that people give on how to use GCC, you can sort of go through that process of, of, um, of using the compiler and then you can call the linker. There's also an archiver you can use for, for creating binaries, libraries and things like that. Um, but then in the world of embedded, I've also seen some other compiler manufacturers or uh, creators and, and they just have a like you call one single file um, and then all of that stuff happens in the background. Um, so what, what sort of variations do you see in terms of compiler tools? Um, it, can, can they all be split out into individual steps so you can really control each stage clearly? Or um, do you see a tendency in the embedded world to just go for a, a compiler tool chain where you, you call one file and um, sort of everything is hidden away in the background? Um, I think if you, if you use the vendor's tools these days, most of it gets hidden behind a single build button. Uh, in the IDE, uh, which I think is quite nice. I don't normally want to worry too much about each individual step. Um, you can split it out and normally if you go into the menus, what you'll find is it calls a command and it first will call the preprocessor and then it'll pass the output to the compiler and then pass the output of that to the linker. Um, but obviously, if you want to get things up and running, you probably don't need to worry about that. And once you've set the tool chain up, it's much easier just to have a single button. And I think that's that's really the way to go. Um, I don't think as individual programmers, we want to worry about each step um, yeah. any more than we have to. There are, of course, times when you do have to manipulate the linker and that sort of thing. Um, the one I personally really dislike is uh, any sort of make file or CMake, anything like that. I just find them really horrible to use, but um, I, I know I'm not <laughs> alone in that opinion, but um, <laughs> some They'd people- struggling that. to learn them, thinking that was probably one of the best ways to do it. <laughs> yeah, and I think use IDEs will handle that for you and now as well. Um, so yeah, I, I just want things like that, you know, essentially admin tasks moved on to an IDE to implement uh, automate for me rather than having to worry about it. I guess one, one of the risks I think in the in, in that approach, obviously the IDEs, they're all there, every microcontroller vendor offers something or as a partnership with someone to offer something. But my my sort of long-term concern is that, you know, if I start using uh, the microchip environment and then move to Nordic later um, or TI, um, at least with a make file, I've got the instructions to build the code in a text readable document. Whereas if I've used the IDE, um, there's no easy way to translate the, the build process from one ID to another, or, or, or do you have other experience there? Um, yeah, I think it, it potentially can cause you all sorts of problems if you're not careful. Um, I think setting up projects in an IDE is always one of the most 
um, as a single task, it's one of the most time consuming bits, however you do it. Um, I can see there, yes, um, there would be a benefit to something like a make file uh, rather than having to manually import each file uh, individually and then building as you would. But I think it's, however you look at it, it's something you, you essentially only have to do once. Um, one good thing I am seeing um, is that at least out of the out of the box, if you like, a lot of the vendors are now shipping with GCC. So there is some sort of standard platform there. Um, yeah. And a lot of the uh, IDEs are built on Eclipse. Um, so you, everything's becoming much more standardized. Um, yeah. That, of course, tends to be for ARM core devices. So, for instance, PIC uh microchip don't don't do that as far as i'm aware um but yeah i think yeah. arm is certainly coming to dominate quite quickly and gcc as well yeah i think the embedded industry is slowly learning <laughs> <laughs> i think there are still some very good embedded compilers out there um, yeah yeah it's just sort of that seems to be the go-to default now exactly yeah no that's, i mean that's also the trend trend i've sort of experienced over the years as well um, but you know, the, the, like you say, there's the exceptions of the definitely the eight bit picks and the twenty four bit picks. Um, I think yeah, they have a slightly at least the eight bit bits have their yeah, rather unique uh, compiler tools. So, um, so we've we've talked a lot about this the the front end of actually turning uh, our code into something. But uh, I also obviously wanted to make use of your time to um, explore some of the language challenges that people have with C. And I think maybe of all the, everything I think is, you know, with time, it's fairly straightforward. And if you come back to look at program uh, a code after walking away from it for a while, which is unfortunately my situation, because I am more sort of reporting on, on the industry as opposed to actually uh, contributing uh, with program development and software development these days. Um, I think one of the challenges is pointers, yeah? and in your book, you rightly point out that pointers are exceptionally powerful. They enable some really important program capabilities like linked lists, things like that, but also uh, for embedded engineers, it allows us to access hardware registers on, on microcontrollers. Do you have any sort of tips for remembering or guiding people what it means when I see a star and when I see an ampersand in my code related to pointers and using pointers? Yeah, I think, it's something I, it's just sort of second nature to me now. Um, so I've not really thought about tips. Um, so I just read the ampersand as address of, and then it'll be followed by a, a variable name. Um, I think the the star causes a bit of confusion um, because in a, in a declaration, um, you're saying I want to declare this variable as a pointer. Um, but elsewhere, it means dereference this pointer. Um, and then the other one is you get a sort of a, a minus sign followed by a rightward arrow, which you use for, to dereference members of a struct. Um, and I think that one causes a lot of confusion um, because people never remember when you're meant to use that and when you're meant to just dereference the struct. Um, but yeah, in terms of tips, I, I can't really think of any because, like I say, it's just got to the point now where it's second nature, unfortunately. Um, yeah, yeah. That's I did I did develop one once. I think um, I said that the the and you could say it's the and stress of something. I think that's a bit of a stretch of the of the English language, but uh, if you've got it's the and dress, then the other one must be the pointer. Yeah, I think um, historically, I think the ampersand used to be used a lot in things like data sheets for microprocessors um, to, to in, indicate an address and perhaps that's where it came from, but I, yeah. I couldn't say for sure. Um, yeah. Well, well, we'll park that then. Maybe some of the, our audience will write in and share some of their thoughts as to uh, how, they, how they remember it and how they uh, train other people when they're, when they're getting new people on board. Now, um, Another sort of important aspect that comes out of, of the book when we're talking about um, programming in C is is, um, is using some sort of coding standard. And I, I think if you're if you're doing stuff on your uh, alone on your own, it doesn't matter too much. But I think when you're in a team, a coding standard really helps to ensure that 
we're all writing in the same manner. When I read code, it looks like something I could have written because we've all used the same approach. Um, how, how much of a coding standard is uh, covering how to use the language and, and how much is sort of stylistic, um, what, what, the, what it should look like on the page? Yeah, so this varies massively. If we look at something like Misracy, uh, it's almost all subsetting the C language. There's not much about style in that. I've been told that that's largely because if you start making recommendations about style, you're essentially guaranteed to upset someone. Um, if you look at, say, Barsi, it's a nice mix. There's plenty in there about style, um, but there's also plenty that's subsetting the C language and saying these are the bits you can use, these are the bits you can't. And then there are some standards out there that are purely a style guide. Um, and I think you need you need a bit of both. Um, I think uh, if, if you're looking for a coding standard that's about making sure I get good, reliable software at the end of it, I would say you need to look at something like Mr. C. Um, but I would also say that in terms of particularly working in a team where people are going to have different backgrounds, they're not necessarily all going to have done things the same way before, but you want a, a consistent code base at the end of the day, you need a style guide as well, and you need to be enforcing that. And I see it a lot um, where that hasn't happened. And you can tell where one person's work is finished and another's started because the, the style completely changes. So and, and when I've looked at uh, coding standards in the past, I've, I've seen tools for Misracy that sort of pass the code and, and check adherence with the standard. Is that the case for Barsi as well? Um, there are some. Um, Barsi, I think, is probably not so widely recognised, um, but it's, it's good. Uh, it's a good standard. It's supposedly completely compatible with Misra. Um, perhaps slightly more lenient. Um, I use a version of PC Lint. Um, unfortunately, that's not available anymore. Um, I it was it was bought out, and I think they've discontinued it or they've rebranded it as something else. But I do know that my version supports uh, checking against Bar C rules and also against Misra C rules. Um, I'd recommend not checking about against too many things at once because you'll just end up with thousands of errors that need correcting. Um, but yes, there are there are tools that will check uh, Barsi, but also any decent tool, you should be able to set your own rules somehow as well. Um, now, one of the other areas I think people struggle with, and there's also a, a lot of almost religious uh, level discussions on it is how you name variables, functions, interrupt service routines. Um, and I think um, I, I think really for yourself, it doesn't matter, but if you're, if you're trying to write some sort of portable library that others are gonna use, it does help to have a sort of a naming convention that makes it clear, for example, uh, what's the data type of this variable that I'm using? Uh, is, this, is this a pointer? Uh, what do you recommend people do in terms of uh, naming conventions? Yeah, so certainly if something's a pointer, I think that's worth uh, highlighting. So I tend to put a, a P as a prefix. Um, so just a P followed by an underscore and then the name. Uh, I'd say the same with something like global variables, if you must use them, is to put you know, a G and an underscore. And then that highlights straight away that it's a global. Other people do it slightly differently, but I think as long as you're highlighting that, um, that's a good place to start. In terms of identifying the, the underlying type of the variable, um, it's not always so clear cut because um, if you ever need to change that type for some reason, all your variable names are then wrong and you've got to go, go through and correct them all. Um, yeah. I think it tends to be worth highlighting if something is say floating point because it behaves fundamentally differently to um, an integer type, for instance. So uh, there I will tend to put a, a suffix on and I'll put an underscore and then an F. Um, and then that just immediately lets me see it's a, 
it's a floating point. Um, yeah. And I think I think I took those rules from Barcy actually, um, so I can't take credit for them. Um, that has to go to Michael Barr. <laughs> But do, do you find that sort of like the IDEs help these days, that they're the, the IDEs are much more advanced, they're, they're analysing the code, they're almost doing a, a pre-processor function, aren't they, to see what you're writing, and then as you're using variables, you know, you get a little a tool tip, as it were, that pops up and says, oh, this is, uh, that gives you the, the data type. Yeah, they, they do. They tend to sort of index things, and as you say, they will check it as you type, essentially, like... Um, like your spell checker in Word, you know, once upon a time you had to actually manually run it, but now, you know, it does it as you're typing. Um, and that that certainly helps. Um, it can also speed things up because it will tend to give you a recommendation. And if it's a, uh, you know, when the recommendation's right, you can just press enter and it fills out the rest of the line for you. Um, so yes, it, it can help. Um, I've never really used it for any sort of error checking. Um, I find it it's sort of a productivity tool rather than a uh, checking for correctness, if you like. Yeah, super. So, I mean, yeah, I'm, I, it's been a while since I did some serious uh, software development, um, but uh, you know, I, I think um, I, I think this, that this is something that can help to a degree is that you know you, you're getting some some advice as as your uh, typing into the into the uh, into the editor there mm. now one point um, variable type you just brought up was the uh, global and, um, and from my experience and, and talking through my profession to other engineers it was I basically get the feeling that it's essentially a sin to use global fair variables um, as there's always a, a method to program without them. But one of the things that surprised me as I was reading the book, I think there was a statement somewhere where you said, well, in rare cases, it's acceptable. Um, could you sort of give us some guidance as to, you know, where you think there's an argument to say, yes, in, I'll let you have a global variable this time? Yeah, I think um, in almost all cases, it's a sin. Um, and in the ones where it's not really a sin, it's still sort of a lesser sin, as in, if you can find a way to avoid it, avoid it. Um, the things that immediately come to mind would be, say, passing variables to or from an inter interrupt service routine. Um, yeah, you you could wrap it in sort of a buffer and various other things, but then essentially you're just hiding the fact that there's a global variable somewhere. Um, so it's not, while it's not quite, not necessarily quite as bad, um, it's still essentially a global. You've just hidden it behind some functions. Um, and then there'll be times, for instance, writing to directly to uh, registers uh, in the hardware. Um, you might find that you essentially end up giving that register a name and it, really it's a global because you can't prevent it being accessed anywhere. Um, yeah. Again, ideally you'd like to avoid that, but sometimes it's the, the quickest, simplest way of doing it. and there isn't that much of an argument to avoid it because you would you would essentially end up implementing some obfuscated global if you like rather than a truly safe alternative exactly yeah yeah i think that's the point and that that's probably i think one of the other aspects that sort of makes embedded programming uh, so interesting is that you know you have these these challenges and uh, you're sort of torn between maybe taking what's programmat programmatically correct approach or a pure approach but then on the other side there's the practicality of well <laughs> it's it's a hardware register there's an address associated with it i just need to get some data in and out of it and so yeah. <laughs> let's just do it <laughs> yeah and i think you just hide the fact that that's what you're doing anyway uh, exactly. rather than having anybody doing it Okay, so we come to that point in the show where we're going to share a giveaway with our audience. So hang in there for a moment. I'm just going to uh, explain how our giveaway works on this week's show. Be back in a moment. So let's pull this up. So um, I said giveaway time to extend our thanks to you as loyal Engineering Insights viewers. Chris has generously donated three copies of his new book, Embedded Experts Guide to C. 
In it, he covers everything from writing safety and managing memory to interacting with hardware and how to optimize your code. Full of informative examples and a host of references, it makes a great companion to your copy of Koenigin and Ritchie. For your chance to win, simply visit the link shown below and enter the keyword expert, that's the keyword expert, with your entry. And we wish you all the luck in the world with that. Super. So let's get back to Chris. Thank you very much for um, making some of those copies available to us. I think it's uh, be really, really nice uh, for everyone to have a copy of that. Um, so um, just one more. The next question, I've just lost it down here on the floor. So I'm just going to put it up here now. Um, C can be exceptionally challenging to read, especially when you're looking at um, hardware register accesses, for example. And there's some examples in the book, I think it's on, on page 51, at least on, on the Kindle version, where there's uh, an unsigned 32-bit variable um, for a register defined with lots of pointers and things like that. Um, is, there, is there a way of breaking down reading those variable definitions that you found works for you? Um, or have you even maybe tried using sort of something like ChatGPT to uh, analyze it and, and give you a simplified breakdown of, of what that line of code is intended to do? Um, I tend to, with the declarations, they can get quite messy. And I tend to try and read them backwards. Um, so if I have um, something long with a pointer in it, um, then it will be something like this this variable is a pointer to uh, an unsigned integer for instance uh, and that would be written uh, unsigned int star uh, variable name and reading it backwards can sort of help there uh, it doesn't always work and things get very messy when you have say um, pointers to functions or anything like that um, but that's the best method i've come up with um, I have to to be honest i've been rather unimpressed with things like chat gpt so far um <laughs> a while back somebody did try and share you know i was, I was having some trouble with um, a piece of software and someone did try and share uh, chat gpt's analysis on it um and yeah it, it wasn't particularly helpful <laughs> i thought this is just as a distraction from actually getting the problem solved um, is yeah. actually going to help but maybe that's just me some people seem very impressed with it so uh, yeah i did um i did actually try entering that into um that example from the book in into chat gpt along with a, another example from the book as well it was i mean it, it, again you know it, it it comes across to me as very devoid of any personality so um when it, when it provides its answers but the answer it provided I, I think it did a good job of explaining what each part of the uh, the definition was so uh, i think um maybe that and a bit of time spent on improving the prompts around it that might uh, that might help but uh, we shall see i'll i'll keep researching and, and uh, i'll show my results now, yeah. one of the interesting things about hardware on microcontrollers um, is when we're working really down at register level and we're trying to access bits, bits or groups of bits, often the bits only, uh, some bits are only read, uh, read only. Um, I've, I've seen sort of register defined in all sorts of ways with structs and unions and all sorts of things like that in, um, in various manufacturers that I've worked for in the past. How do you go about, or what do you what do you think works well for defining hardware registers, and also making sure that you know that some of those aren't clearly read only bits? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the most common way I've seen is, as you say, with structs and bit fields, um, and sometimes you'll get a union there. Um, so quite often, what you will have is a struct that identifies each bit individually. But then that itself is within a union and the whole thing is um, uh, also accessible through an integer uh, variable of some some size that corresponds to the register size um, in terms of read only bits um, they quite often will just be left unnamed and left as padding um, but structs are quite poorly defined in the the C language, so you probably wouldn't want to write one of these yourself. Um, 
so it gets it gets quite difficult fortunately i think most of the platforms if they have a a read only bit in a register they just won't accept a value being put into it um, but then also you need to read the data sheet on that because sometimes they will say this is read only but also you shouldn't change its value uh, which okay. obviously doesn't help so if, if you are writing your own um your own libraries to do this rather than using those provided by the vendor you do need to be very careful um what you can do is make the whole variable um const qualified um which may help but it's also not guaranteed to um so one of the things about C, uh, going back to those gotchas, you can qualify a variable as const, which you would think means constant, but it actually doesn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, there's there's no easy answer to that. The best thing to do is use the the vendor libraries or make sure you really know what you are doing, which will mean reading the data sheet and reading your compiler documentation and knowing how to um, set that up correctly. I mean, I've, I've worked on data sheets for microcontrollers in the past and, and other peripheral chips and things like that. And, and we've, we've specifically written in certain places, yeah, this is a, a read-only bit, knowing full well that it can be written mm. <laughs> and you don't want to write it. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is this is sort of part of the challenge. And it, it results in, 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 in um, bugs and, and issues occurring that are really difficult to resolve. You know, so and, and if you can't use the language to protect those accesses, that makes it a bit of a problem, doesn't it? Yeah, and I think the other the other thing you can potentially do is wrap the access in a function. So you would have a, a read function for that register or a write function, and then be very careful about how you make that that function yeah. work so that it doesn't uh, affect those bits. Um, exactly, yeah. But again, you you've then find yourself in a situation you hand that over to somebody else and they decide not to use your functions and it's not you know nobody's been helped by that um no yeah. exactly that brings me also on to um another area of, of of embedded uh the embedded approach to c programming that we tend to avoid is uh that of floating point variables um i mean typically it's a no-no uses enormous number of cycles to basic calculations most of them are integer devices but i think we're, we're sort of coming to this point in the industry where you look at that maybe uh, a cortex m7 device and and some of the the more powerful socs they do have floating point support in hardware as a as a as a developer if i know there's floating point support in the chip can i assume that the compiler is capable of leveraging the floating point unit or FPU, or is that something that typically has to be explicitly defined? Um, that's going to depend quite a lot on the compiler, uh, unfortunately. So some of them will probably be very good at supporting uh, the FPU, others perhaps not. Um, certainly, I think you're right in that historically, uh, floating point was avoided because it's it's slow it's non-deterministic and has all sorts of issues if you're not if you don't have a floating point unit to support it as you say that's not so much of an issue anymore um, even on integer processors where floating point operations might take a hundred times as long as uh, an integer operation some of the clock speeds now are high enough that it almost doesn't matter um, but you know it, it a lot of it comes down to the compiler um and the quality of the libraries and also if you do have a floating point unit um how well that supported that is by the compiler um yeah. and whether you have to use particular pragmas or um set certain registers or anything like that to make it work is another matter entirely it comes down to the compiler and your device obviously yeah and another another sort of area of, of challenge in in developing code is um, you get to the point where you know you've got quite a lot of go, going on on the device and you're running out of uh, processing cycles to to ex execute it all, um, and then it's a question of how how maybe do I best optimize it? Um, em embedded hardware sometimes means that we we actually get to the point where we say well I'm going to have to rewrite the code in C for a specific microcontroller. Um, in order to op optimize it for the device. 
do, do you see that compiler the optimizers or optimization capability in compilers are still not maybe good enough to always do this task or um, do you think the optimizers generally speaking are, are pretty good at helping out um, I think optimizers probably do a better job most of the time than even a very skilled programmer will um, one thing with optimization I find is we always need to think about what it is we're actually trying to optimize um, yeah often we we assume it's speed but quite often it could be something else it could be you know we're, we're trying to reduce power usage of a device which actually your your compiler optimizer might not be so good at um, but yeah certainly if it's speed or code size um, which tend to be the the two things that are supported by compilers these days uh, the compiler will probably do a better job than you will um, the other thing is it also has more flexibility um, so a lot of compilers now or tool chains really will also support link time optimization which is where they can completely um, remove function calls and just copy things in and uh, you know can, can make big changes that actually if you're trying to work across several files you can't really do that without making a complete mess of your code base but then once it's machine code it doesn't matter anyway because yeah. i've never met anyone who can read it exactly yeah and in the chapter on optimizations one of the things you recommend and what you're saying now as well is that you, you shouldn't be too clever um with your code and it, it makes sense to also check it with a with a lint tool just to make sure you've not I guess introduce some sort of obscure approach to um, writing how a function should work. But one one of the things that uh, um, I didn't see in the book was that you don't mention running software tests. Um, and from my mind, bear, bearing in mind that hardware um, software tests can be actually run on the hardware, um, that to me would seem like a way of finding any errors that are introduced by that optimization process or the the optimizer from from the compiler tools. Um, am I missing something there or is, um, you know, what's your sort of thinking on, on testing embedded C code? Um, well, I mean, from an optimization point of view, um, I don't think my, my view on testing is any different to what it would be elsewhere. Um, absolutely, we should be doing tests, um, whether or not they're run on the device or uh, you build and test on a separate machine is another question uh, i think there's a some people are quite opposed to tests and i don't really understand why um, there are obviously some things that are very difficult to test you know if you if it very much depends on the state of the hardware at a particular time um, you know doing a getting complete test coverage of that is going to be almost impossible but then that's a problem that you have with testing anyway but we all still agree that testing is a good thing and we should be doing it um, in terms of uh, optimization and testing um, to be honest my my gut feeling is actually you should probably avoid optimizing um, if you can anyway and you you only sort of turn optimizations on when when all other options have failed um, because i think even the standard standard settings now um, are, are fairly good it's not not going to deliberately generate suboptimal code um, no, exactly, yeah. the, the only thing that makes a difference is if you have a, a debug setting in there um, that tends to slow things down because it has to add bits in for to support the debugging but then if you're testing you're probably going to want to attach a debugger anyway so that doesn't really help you <laughs> yeah no exactly now I'm, I must say I've, I've been looking around um, at what's going on and, and I was reading your book and reflecting on, on my career and, and, and past and I'm, I must say I'm starting to get the feeling that C's days and, and numbers uh, are numbered a bit. Um, there's so many glaringly obvious failings, um, it seems to require so much extra love and care to ensure functional safety for example, we, we, we go to enormous lengths to check the code and, and, and uh, pass it and, and make sure it's with is written in the right way do, do you think we're doing enough fast enough in standards committees to keep it relevant for it for embedded applications or um you know is 
you know, do you also sort of get the feeling that we're we're, we're slowly losing this language maybe as as the language for for embedded systems? I think possibly over a very long period of time we might lose it. Um, I think what we have to bear in mind is um, a, a lot of embedded systems might have a, a an intended lifetime of twenty to thirty years, and um, they'll be sold to someone very stubborn who wants to keep them going 40 or 50 years. So we could well be supporting things written in C today um, towards the end of this century, perhaps. Um, so I, I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. I think slowly other things may become um, the preferred option. We are seeing more C++ now. Um, Certainly, there's a lot of talk of Rust. Um, but I'm also aware that I think people have been saying C is going to die for years um, because we have known about these issues for years and we've known that um, something needs to be done and there are better alternatives out there. But uh, yeah. you know, for a time, it looked like Ada would be um, would would replace C um, and that didn't happen. Um, no. For a time, you know, Pascal as well was very popular, but that sort of died out as well, which, you know, in hindsight, you probably say, well, maybe we should have stuck with Pascal and got rid of C um, because then we wouldn't have all these problems, but that didn't happen. Um, so, yeah, I, I sort of think over time, I probably think it would die out because it's a very old language now um, and there are much, uh, much better languages, arguably, out there. Um, but I also think we will be supporting C um, for a long time, simply because you know we've got products that are lasting 20, 40, 50 years, exactly, uh, yeah. and don't have a choice. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, when you when we get to the end of the book, um, one of the things you mentioned in there is is the fact that the fact that Rust is on the horizon. It's um, a topic that I've covered in this show and also um, on the website as well on many occasions. And that really seems to offer, when we, we look at it, a lot of benefits over C. What's your feeling on Rust at the minute? Are we on the cusp of something there? And if you were advising students studying today, um, would you be saying to them, look, you know, uh, don't just focus on C, C++, take the time to, to um, examine Rust as well? Um, yeah, I think I would certainly recommend having a look at Rust. Um, trying to learn it if you can um, i keep thinking i should probably learn it but as yet i've not had a good reason to um so i've, I've just not dedicated the time to that um, in terms of whether or not we're on the cusp of something i think it really depends how things go um i think there's possibly a risk that um if we're not very careful about rust it will go a similar direction to see and all the benefits that it is supposed to get us now will be lost um so if we look at yeah. c it took 20 20 years nearly before the first version of the standard came out and in that time um so many variations of the compiler had been or c compilers had been developed all subtly different that trying to standardize them while not breaking compatibility with that was incredibly difficult um so yeah I, if we're not very careful about how Rust is developed, I can see it going the same way, simply because it becomes very popular. Lots of different compilers are made. People start adding their own extensions and things like this, and slowly those benefits are lost. Uh, although one thing it does have uh, is good memory safety, which C is notoriously yeah. poor at because you can just write memory from anywhere, essentially. Exactly, yeah. Well, thank you ever so much for your time, Chris. I really appreciate it. And uh, it's great to have an expert in the language on the show and and, and share all those insights. Uh, all, all the best in the world with the book. I hope it's a, a huge success. And um, yeah, it was great to have you. Yeah, thank you, Stuart. Well, that's all we have time for in this episode. So what did we learn? C is a brilliant programming language and well matched to getting the full performance out of microcontrollers. However, there are plenty of pitfalls and opportunities for mistakes. Even things you think are clear, like a char always being 8 bits in size, often turn out not to be the case.
While most of C's functionality is relatively easy to understand, it is pointers that cause a lot of confusion and lead to coding mistakes. Chris recommends reading complex definitions, such as those used to define registers, backward, as this can help to understand what is meant. Otherwise, you should consider using a coding standard such as Misera or Bar C, and the tools that check against these rules to help ensure your code remains free of mistakes. And if you're struggling to improve your C programming skills, why not take a look at Chris's book, The Embedded Expert's Guide to C. My thanks go out today to uh, our expert, Chris Rose from Electric Innovation. You've delivered us some outstanding engineering insights. So that wraps it up for today. If you'd like more of the same, we're broadcasting two episodes of Engineering Insights every month in 2023. And to keep you abreast of industry trends this year, take a look at News Bytes, our monthly 15 minute show. Please like, subscribe to Elector TV Industry on YouTube and share our videos on whatever platforms you use. Additionally, you can now drop by the website at electormagazine.com slash EEI to see the topics for future shows and sign up for regular updates and reminders. Finally, if you'd like to join me as a guest, write me an email, drop me a tweet or reach out to me, Stuart Cording, on LinkedIn. Thanks for joining. Stay in touch and don't forget to keep asking your engineering questions.